How do you preserve culture? We're going to talk about that and other things regarding this passage. Uh, I'm Daniel Kaplan. I'm here with my father, Dr. Kaplan. We read through the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy over the course of this year, a little bit every day. Today we're reading Exodus uh, 12, 21 through 28. I'll be reading from the Robert Alter translation, and then we will be discussing what we have read. And Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, draw out and take yourselves sheep according to your clans and slaughter the Passover offering. And you shall take a bundle of hyssop uh, and you shall dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and you shall touch the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and to the doorpost. And as for you, none of you shall go out from the entrance of his house till morning. And the Lord shall cross through, discourage Egypt, and he shall see the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts. And the Lord shall pass over the entrance, and he shall not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to scourge. And you shall keep this thing as a statute for you and your sons everlasting. I believe that's it. Nope. Uh, <laughs> and so when you come to the land that the Lord will give you as he has spoken, you shall keep the service. And so should your sons ask you, what is a, this service to you? You shall say a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when he scourged Egypt and our households he rescued, and the people bowed and did obeisance. And the Israelites went and did as the Lord had charged Moses and Aaron. Thus did they do. All right, so now we have the specific instructions about what to do with the lamb, and we have this very graphic ritual. I mean, it's a graphic ritual. You know, they're taking the blood, and they're covering their doorposts. Of course, beautiful Christology, right, for what's going to happen later in the biblical narrative. Um, you know, absolutely stunning from that standpoint. Uh, we had somebody in the comments mention that one way they like to decorate for Passover is by putting, like, a red garland around their household. I think that's nice to commemorate this. You know, you could like put, Rahab do you with the, uh, <laughs> with the scarlet uh, thread, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, so that one wall doesn't fall down. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Hopefully, their house is better constructed than that. Um, what, what is this? Uh -oh. I'm going to discourage the Egyptians, it's it, uh, uh it, scourge, not oh, discourage. scourge. Okay, I'm sorry, good. Yeah, I, I hope you. I didn't say that wrong. Shall I mean, cross through discourage Egypt. Okay, I just heard it wrong. Maybe I, I said it wrong. I heard like discourage. I'm thinking it's much worse than that. <laughs> so it's just yeah, a minor yeah, setback. Yeah, Your yeah. children are dying. All and, right. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. Um, but here is where, if you want to make the argument, the argument that we make, Christian commandment keepers, pronomian, whatever you want to call us, in terms of tradition and how they matter, is you can see how the Bible directly correlates ceremony and preserving your culture. And it is like directly tied in. The reason why you do these things is so you can educate your children, right? You do special ceremonies, you do ritual so that you can remind them. And you could say, well, you could just tell them any which way. Fair enough, but think of how human beings tend to react. Think of how human beings tend to operate. A lot of the things that you have strong memories of are associated with something more complicated than just somebody telling you information, right? It's uh, There often is like a ceremony involved or things like that. I mean, tradition outlasts belief. There are people that will do things like put up Christmas trees or whatever, and they have no particular connection to the New Testament. They just do it because other people are doing it. And imagine we lived in a culture where everybody did something on Passover night, even if they weren't all that religious. Wouldn't that be better? I would say yes, because you're starting the conversation from a different place. That's what you have in Israel now. Right. A lot of secular people that do a lot of these things, part of the national culture. And I think that, that, yeah, that that's yeah. that's to their benefit. You know, you could say, well, is Israel such a righteous country? Maybe not, but no. <laughs> I mean, it's not. But I do think it's to your benefit. And I think there is something about cultural preservation that occurs when you when you do such things. If you look at if you look at groups that have managed to stay, you know, more or less their beliefs haven't shifted too much, you often will see cultural practices, ritual, things like that, tradition, and it does matter. I think people get so bogged down in the New Testament where God is criticizing a lot of the additional traditions and a lot of the regulations to think that God is anti what he asked them to do in the first place. Because that's how we operated. All all through the Bible, it's like, well, circumcise yourself as a reminder. Do this as a reminder. And then all of a sudden, you get to the New Testament, and it's like, nope, that's not my thing anymore. I really don't care. There's, It, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not very consistent. And I guess people will say, well, the Holy Spirit or whatever, but... I, it's just such an inconsistency. I prefer to think that God knows human beings as who they are, and he continues to operate the same way throughout. 
That's my little rant about festivals. Yes? Yeah, well, if you're keeping to festivals, then you're going to do certain things. I mean, of course, right. eating unleavened bread for a week is already something. Yep. And, and I have a friend who does that, even though she's not very religious, because I've done it. And she gets something out of it from a moralistic perspective. And uh, also, you know, if you keep the festival of, of tabernacles or booths by actually, you know, leaving your residence and, be, and being in a temporary residence, that that's also something quite different, from, mm -hmm. you know, so. There are yeah, things, something to shake up the norm. There are things you're going to do just to keep these festivals. Right. Or, or Pentecost. If you keep Pentecost, you're going to have two two days of rest in a row, which you, most years that doesn't happen except at that time. Right. So once again, it's something out of the ordinary. Right. So each of the festivals has their unique uh, character. Like Festival of Trumpets, if you if you really keep it, you're going to do some kind of trumpeting or noise making of some kind. Right. So and of course, fasting on atonement. Right. So just keeping these festivals, uh, in terms of the character of each one, you're you're going to have certain things you're going to do or not do mm -hmm. that'll be unique. Right. And if you look at and if you look at um, and I think this is something to keep in mind as you're deciding how to do it, right, is to think of the purpose. And that's, um, I have a video on uh, this channel about celebrating the holidays, <laughs> and I mention a lot of things that are designed to help you teach your children, because I do think that is a purpose, right? It is, it's not only for you, it's for the next generation, it's for preservation of belief, right? It does both things. And so I think that is something to keep in mind when you decide, okay, I want to celebrate, you know, Passover, as my dad was saying, you know, there's not a lot of specific rules it says you know you have to eat unleavened bread and bitter herbs and that's about it so then what else do you do well i would say the kind of stuff like this where it says you know when your sons ask you you know what is this you know do things that prompt questions that prompt a response that can give that indelible memory so they can be like oh well the reason why we did this was because of this and the reason why we did this is because of this and i think that's where you end up with something really solid again to go back to christmas i think one reason why that holiday isn't as effective as it could be is something like a christmas tree is detached from a specific meaning most people won't tell you a consistent meaning of it and so I think it does not serve as well of a purpose as if it had been more thoughtful in how it was introduced. I think it would be more beneficial to our culture in that way. Yeah. Uh, Sean says he's going to hit the road and blast scriptural music out of his car stereo for trumpets. That sounds awesome. <laughs> you do that. Send us a video. That's great. Um, <laughs> but speaking of music, the, the, one of the major factors in the Yuletide season is the music. Yep. And Holy Day should have a lot of beautiful music associated with them. Yep. And that is true in Hebrew culture, but not in the pronomian culture. But in some ways, a lot of people are new to it. Mm -hmm. But those of you who have creative talents, uh, let's go to work and, and produce some really nice music associated with these holy days. Yep, absolutely. Now, I have a question. This is something that Ten Commandments brings up. <laughs> because Ten Commandments creates a scenario in which uh, Joshua... Acron anachronistically, but you know, whatever. Joshua gets some blood and he sneaks it over and he puts it on mm. somebody's door. The way that this is written, I'm not sure that actually was an option. I don't know if that would have worked. I think the person had to do it themselves. I don't think you could be a vigilante and and do that. I think that actually it's almost and, and if you think about what it symbolizes, it's a little weird. It's like, can you strong arm somebody into accepting the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Like it, it it's a little weird. It reminds me with, with all due respect, but it remind it reminds me of the Mormon practice of baptism for the dead. You know, that uh, Yeah. It would seem like each person has to make that commitment. I would think so, right? Yeah. Because you because here's the question, right? If that's what saves them, well wouldn't they do that for some of them? Obviously uh, you know, they don't like them very much, but maybe not all of them would have been that. You would have thought that that they would have, but maybe, and I don't think they did because I don't think they could have. Now, whether or not some Egyptians did it because they were scared or they saw other people doing it, I don't know. There is a mixed group of people that leaves, but but uh, you know, so who knows? Because I mean, if you see people doing it and they're like, "Well, God said that if we don't do this, He's going to kill our son." You might do it in a sense, you know, you might humble yourself to do it. I don't know. I never thought about what the mixed multitude did, whether they lost their firstborn or not before yeah. they 
for them. I mean, they could have too, and then decided to repent afterwards after the punishment. Yeah. But I, but, but what I will say is, I disagree with Cecil B. DeMille in that I think he oversteps. Yeah. I don't think that. And I, I don't think anybody on this channel is, takes that as canon or something. But I'm just saying, uh, it, sometimes you just let those things creep in, though, and right, you just don't yeah, think about it. Right. If you think about it, I just don't think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I don't think that you could have strong-armed somebody into keeping this command. I just uh, That makes no sense to me. Okay. I mean, I guess on, in that movie, he's doing on behalf of the, of, the, of the woman. But even so, I just don't know. I don't know. Well, maybe. see, in that case, she would have done it if she could have. It's not quite the same. Yeah, thing. maybe. He's not sneaking in there in spite of her. Or, yeah, or, no, you're right. So maybe, maybe in that case, let's be a little generous to the to the Hollywood <laughs> in this case. She would. It is an unusual situation because it doesn't exactly define what a firstborn is. Too, it's a little bit unclear. Because, like, what if you had a miscarriage? Would that have counted? Although it is true that she, <laughs> I mean, there's just so many questions like that. It is true that she tells him not that it really matters. She tells him she wants to die. And so don't do it, you know, yeah. because of that. But, yeah, she does. But, but, but I, you know, that's not probably not really how she feels. But who, you know, anyway, <laughs> we don't don't have to belabor this. <laughs> we're gonna do a deep Anna. Now, now we're gonna do a daily podcast about Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments, <laughs> just because. No, I just I just bring that up because sometimes yeah, that stuff you you don't really think of it as canon, but it just kind of seeps in there. And I think we should probably think rethink that and like. Mm, Probably not. Because I don't think of this, I don't honestly think of this as just about the blood. I think it has to do with you committing yourself to the whole process. It's not just, it's not, it's not, that sounds kind of pagan. It's like, well, you just splatter some blood and everything's cool. I feel like it's a lot, it, it, there's a, mind, there's still a mindset thing. I know people like yes, to get on, yes. I know, well, people like to get on that because they're like, well, the Old Testament was about ritual and the New Testament is about mindset. And that's just so wrong. And I, I, and so I just want to, get on my high horse about that. I want to go to some Psalms here. Uh, Psalm 34. Yes. Um, um, in verse 20, he guards all the bones. Uh, not one of them is broken. Uh, he's talking about the righteous person. Many yes. of the afflictions of the righteous, but the eternal delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. His specifically whatever it means in general, but it does apply to Christ that they did a lot to him, but didn't break his bones. And right. you weren't supposed to break the bones of the, of the Passover sacrifice. Right. So that is, that is another way of the type antitype uh, co uh, concept. Right. And um, also I wanted to go to um, another Psalm. And uh, this Psalm may be uh, one that uh, relates to the Passover season. Yeah. I'm having trouble, uh, getting to it here on my phone so let's just talk about Psalm 91 it, and and if you if you look at Psalm 91 it, it seems to almost be talking about this this time where Egypt is being plagued mm -hmm. and and firstborn are dying but the right. Israelites are being protected right and and again talking about Cecil B DeMille uh, the night, the night of the Passover yeah. he has them chanting Psalm 90, Psalm, Psalm 91 it, it does seem it does seem to fit mm -hmm. and what's interesting about Psalm 91 is preceded by Psalm 90 which is a psalm of Moses mm. so it, it could be that Psalm 91 goes back to that time yeah that is interesting now here's a question because it says the Israelites went and did as the Lord had charged Moses thus they did or thus thus did they do um do you think every last man, woman, and child actually followed the directions? Because they don't seem very good at that later. Well, by now, they've seen an awful lot to convince them, too. I know, but think about what's going to happen in a very short period of time. Yeah, well... Those that didn't would have would have. Uh, I know, but I actually lost, would. Lost I would postulate. I would postulate that some didn't, and that did happen. But just just thinking of human psychology, and that just because it says thus they did, it means in general. You know, that's my that's my little take. I'm not trying to add to the Bible or anything. I'm just saying, keep in mind, it is possible based on the way the Israelites are throughout the Bible that not all of them actually did, in fact. Fulfill this, but there are and times. There, consequences. there are times, refreshing moments. There are when they seem to be be on on board, like Nehemiah. Uh, there, there are yeah. certain times when when you, you know, you breathe. Is it Nehemiah really, where it says they that that, that was the, right, the time Nehemiah, they did it more than any Nehemiah, other time? Right. There yeah. are times when when uh, they they're on board with the, with the plant with the program. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think Christina has a good point. It was a desire of a heart to obey God and do what he's commanded, not just slap some blood on your door because your neighbor is doing it. I do wonder about that. I would think, I don't think you could do it. Not to mention, you couldn't do it with each other, right? Because you had to use your own. So you would have had to have your own lamb. And there was a specific time you were supposed to do it. So there was there was, there was was a lot to it. it. I don't think you could have used other people's blood now let me say unless you were in else. the clan. If I were to call Christina... <laughs> At 2 a.m., she might say, why are you bothering me in the middle of the night? Or, why are you calling me so early in the morning? Yes. And that's the situation here. Mm -hmm. Israel left by night, Deuteronomy 16. But they also left in the morning, Exodus 12. Because it was the period of the morning watch from 2 to 6. When it's still night, it's morning, but yet it's, it's also still night. So that that's a way of harmonizing those accounts. Right. And I'm not going to call you at 2 a.m. I don't even have your phone number anyway. <laughs> she has young kids, so please don't. Oh, uh, <laughs> all right. Um, anything else about this uh, Passover section before we move forward? I think we've caused enough trouble for one session. All right. So yeah. if you haven't yet, please like, subscribe, hit the bell. We will see you tomorrow. All right, so...